Okay, terrific. So welcome everyone. Before I introduce Ellen, I just wanna go over some um, information about upcoming programs. I'm Gwen Schroeder. I'm not sure um, who else from our board besides Helen is he, uh, Ellen is here, but um, Peggy Larber, our president is here. I don't know if you can all see her, um, but uh, we expect a few more uh, and Robin is, I'm gonna admit Robin Simmon any minute. So um, welcome everyone. I just wanna let you know about some um, upcoming programs. Uh, next Thursday, September 29th, 7 p.m. via Zoom, we are going to have a program on the life of Frederick Law Olmsted, and that's gonna be presented by Dr. Roxanne Zimmer. Um, it should be very interesting. I read a little bit about um, Mr. Olmsted uh, recently, and it's uh, he was quite, other than uh, his, his design work, he was quite an interesting individual. So I hope you will uh, join us for that. You can go to our website under programs and events, and then under programs, you can register. On Friday, October 7th, there will be a, a bird walk at the Townsend Edwards Farm Preserve that will be led by Jody Levin, and that's in uh, Orient, uh, just on the main road east of Terry Lane, if anybody's familiar with Terry Lane. Um, so on Tuesday, this is exciting, um, Tom Damiani, who does our Tuesdays for Tom, will be leading, uh, a, it's really an all day trip to the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. I've never been, but I hear it's spectacular. So you can, um, you can go to our website and register for any of or all of these programs if you'd like. We also are very excited, our, um, our uh, Young Birders Club is starting up again. And you'll find that under our youth programs. And that's gonna be led by Jennifer Murray, who has uh, led quite a few um, you know, youth programs for us. She did our camp uh, the summer before last and she is um, associated with Turtleback Farm. So um, she's a wonderful naturalist, very, very uh, she's well-informed and she loves kids. So if you know any little seven to 14 year olds, if you know any children that would like to participate, please send them our way. So I'm gonna introduce you now to Ellen Berenbaum. Ellen joined our board in 2002. She's a retired doc, uh, a medical doctor, and uh, she is part of our landscape committee. And this concept of berries for birds was really her idea. Um, it's uh, sort of this wider um, effort to plant burying bushes and shrubs to help support bird life. And she'll talk about it later. Um, she was very influenced by um, Dr. Doug Calame, who is the author of several books. And he created this um, concept of a homegrown national park, which Ellen will talk about. But I have a few, um, before I actually, uh, introduce Ellen, I just wanna ask everybody to please keep yourself muted and save questions uh, for the end of the uh, presentation. And you can put them in the chat at any time, but they will be answered at the end of the presentation. So uh, I'm gonna introduce you to Ellen, Ellen Berenbaum. Thanks, Gwen. I'm Ellen Berenbaum, and thank you for joining us this evening. By way of introduction, I'm a gardener and I love the beauty and harmony that I find in my Orient garden. What I want to share with you is this, that my garden with the addition of well-chosen native plants also feeds insects and birds. My garden is part of a national movement to restore biodiversity. Each of you can participate in this restoration where you live or work. The following presentation will show you the way. And again, thank you all for coming to discuss various berries for birds, a community approach to biodiversity restoration. This is a new North Fork Audubon initiative in partnership with Homegrown National Park. Here is the outline of my presentation. First, we will briefly define ecosystems and biodiversity, then talk about the biodiversity crisis, coevolution of plants, insect, and birds. We will review the importance of keystone plants 
and most importantly, discuss to solutions to the biodiversity crisis. An ecosystem is defined as a community of living organisms interacting with each other and the surrounding environment. Biodiversity is measured by the number of species in a given location. Each species has a specific role in maintaining balance within the ecosystem. Biodiverse ecosystems can better withstand environmental stresses. I would like to define what is meant by the food chain and food webs. A food chain is the linear movement of energy through the ecosystem. Plants convert solar energy to food through photosynthesis. Plant eating animals are eaten by flesh eating animals, otherwise known as the predator chain. The food web, all food chains in a single ecosystem. Each organism in an ecosystem is part of multiple food chains. I'd like to start the discussion of the biodiversity crisis by describing a thought experiment by Edmund O. Wilson. He asked, what would happen if humans disappeared? He answered, if human beings were to disappear tomorrow, the world would go on with little change and set about healing itself and return itself to the rich environmental state of a few thousand years ago. He then asked, what would happen if insects disappeared? The answer, I doubt that human species could last more than a few months. Most of the fishes, amphibians, birds, and mammals would crash into extinction. Next would go the bulk of flowering plants. The explanation for his conclusions relates to the importance of insect function. Insects are vital pollinators, recyclers of ecosystems, and the basis of all food webs. E.O. Wilson's thought experiment, which was considered unlikely in 1987, now has been supported by data from the Creffield Society, among others. The society was established in 1905 in the small industrial town of Creffield, Germany. It's a group of about 50 amateur entomologists. They began collecting flying insects in 1982 with identical traps in the same locations with a standardized method for weighing the insects. The data was first published in 2013, but got little attention. It was reanalyzed and republished in 2017 in an online open source publication. What they found is that from 1989 to 2013, the mass of insects declined 78%. This study gained traction, and according to the Economist, the Creffield Etymological Society paper was the third most frequently cited scientific study in the world in 2017. The following year, 2018, the New York Times Sunday Magazine cover story was entitled, The Insect Apocalypse is Here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Locally, New York State just published a three-year survey about native pollinators in New York State. 23% of species are at risk. 15% of species have not been seen since the year 2000. And more than 50% of species are insecure. I know that statistics and graphs are hard to relate to. Consider then the windshield phenomena or the ob observation that fewer dead insects accumulate on the windshield of people's cars since the 2000s. I ask you, when was the last time you needed to clean your windshield because it was covered with dead insects? In addition to the massive decline in bird population, a massive decline in insect population, a massive decline in bird population 
has been documented in an article published in Science in 2019 by Rosenberg et al. The graph on the far left shows that there has been a decline, decline of 2.9 billion birds between 1970 and the late 20 teens. On the right, the graph shows the proportion of species declining according to habitat. For the Eastern forest, it has declined almost 20%. Are the declines in insects and insectivorous birds related? Doug Tallamy further analyzed data from Rosenberg's 2019 article and found a strong relationship between insect decline and bird decline. As you can see from the graph, there was roughly a 10 million decline per species of birds for whom insects were essential where there was no significant change in population of birds where insects were not essential. To expand the biodiversity crisis beyond insect and birds, a 2019 report estimated that 1 million animals and plant species are now threatened with extinction. The causes of insect population decline are habitat loss, plant choice, invasive species, pesticide use, light pollution, and climate change. The causes of bird population decline overlap considerably. Habitat loss, plant choice, invasive species, pesticide use in breeding and wintering areas, light pollution, climate change, insect decline, cat predation, and human mortality human-caused mortality. A word about habitat loss. Grass has, re has replaced more than 40 million acres of our diverse native plant communities. In new suburban developments, more than 90% of the landscape is planted in grass. Grass chemicals, over-fertilization, increased water consumption, and mower emissions all contribute to a negative environmental impact. So how do plants, insects, and birds interact? Let's first define plant categories. Native plant species are plants that historically or currently present in a particular eco ecosystem as a result of natural evolution. Introduced plant species, otherwise known as exotic, alien, or non-native plants, are plants living outside their native distribution range, introduced into a region by human activity, either intentionally or inadvertently. The impact of introduced plants is variable. Sometimes plants may have little or no impact, while others have a substantial negative impact on local ecosystems invasive plant species. Introduce plants that cause ecological, environmental, and or economical change in their new location spreading naturally. I'll now discuss the importance of coevolution of native plants and birds. Native plants and native birds have evolved together over 3.8 billion years and are mutually dependent. Birds eat fruits, buds, and nectars of plant, thereby pollinating plants and dispersing their seeds. Seeds are dispersed by attaching to feathers, being carried on beaks or claws during and after feeding and through fecal material. High nitrogen content in bird excrement serves as fertilizer for the seed. In Eastern deciduous forests, at least 300 trees, shrubs, and vines depend solely on birds to spread their seeds. In addition, plants have evolved to promote seed dispersal. Brightly colored fruits attract birds who have an acute sense of vision and color discrimination. Some berries and fruits have waxy coatings that reflect ultraviolet light visible to birds. Shrubs and trees 
without brightly colored fruits have bright stems and brilliant fall leaves that attract birds when their fruit ripens. How do native and non-native berries compare? The nutritional value of native berries is far greater than that of invasive berries. Invasive their berries have higher growth rates compared to natives, which gives them a competitive advantage. Observational studies have also shown the following. Birds prefer native berries when they have the option. Migrating birds will not stay long in an invasive predominant habitat, but will linger in habitats with native berries. The most abundant native berries are consumed at a faster rate than invasives. As preferred foods are exhausted, berries that have been ignored are added to the diet. The presence of berries of invasive species during the winter promotes invasion and range expansive expansion by non-native plants. I'll next, I'll next discuss the importance of insects. Caterpillars are the larval stage of members of the order Lepidoptera, comprising butterflies and moths. 97% of American terrestrial birds read their, rear their young on caterpillars and adult moths with soft body rather than seeds, berries, or hard-shelled insects. Caterpillars have high amounts of proteins, fat, and carotenoids, which improve color vision and reproduction and are a major component of colorful feather impacts. Pigments. Nestlings eat full caterpillar meals 30 to 40 times daily. Habitat that does not contain enough caterpillars is not suitable for successful breeding. I'd next like to discuss the co-evolution of insects and plants. Native plants differ by orders of magnitude in their ability to host insects. There are specialized relationships between most plant-eating insects and the plants they eat. 90% of plant-eating insects are diet specialists. They can only develop on the plants with which they share an evolutionary history. Next, we'll turn to keystone plants. Approximately 5% of our local plants host 70 to 75% of the local caterpillar species. These hyperproductive plants are called keystone plants. Without keystone plants, the local food web falls apart. Keystone plants regenerate biodiversity. Keystone plants support insects with then support animals that feed on them. Most animals do not eat plants directly but eat insects that feed on plants. Planting keystone plants increases the number of species or biodiversity in the local ecosystem. I'll next discuss keystone plant rankings. In 2009, Doug Calamy compared the value of native versus introduced plants and their ability to serve as host plants for Lepidoptera. As you can see on the graph on the right, native woody ornamentals and herbaceous plants far exceeded the introduced species in their ability to support caterpillars. Here are the keystone plant rankings, the best keystone plant rankings for our area. Number one are oaks, Number two, cherries and plums. Number three, willows. Four are birches. Five, poplars and cottonwoods. Six are crab apples. The herbaceous plants that are best at supporting insects are goldenrods, asters, and sunflowers. Our last topic and most important is solutions for the biodiversity crisis. E.O. Wilson's book published in 2019 called Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life proposed this. 
The half earth proposal offers a solution commensurate with the magnitude of the problem. Only by setting aside half the planet in reserve or more, can we save the living part of the environment and achieve the stabilization required for our own survival. Although this vision is bold and laudatory, it is impractical and most likely impossible to implement. A more practical solution is offered by Doug Technology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. After the 2019 publication of his book, Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard, Doug Tallamy was the speaker at the 2020 North Fork Audubon Society Holiday Benefit, which I attended. I was inspired by his work. The key concepts are as follows. Grassroots approach to conservation. Conservation of private property where people live and work. It relies on the initiatives of private individuals to turn their yards into conservation corridors, which he names homegrown national parks. Homegrown national park is a movement promoting national global awareness, not just of the problem, but of the solution. A changed culture, recognition that nature is not optional and that everybody owns responsibility to sustain it. A key component is to measure conservation progress by having each individual document their native plant efforts on the map. This is a map of the United States. And here is a map of Suffolk, Suffolk County, the North Fork and the South Fork. The firefly at the very tip of the, floor of the North Fork is my home. I'm on the map. The way that the map is quantified is by plantings per acre. The goal is 20 million acres, which is approximately half the number of acres that's currently planted in grass in the United States. What's the local solution for the biodiversity crisis and for the problem of declining bird population? Berries for birds. Long Island is very important for migrating birds along the Atlantic Flyway. Long Island and Plum Island are right in the middle of the flyway. For a successful annual migration, birds must consume large quantity of highly nutritious food to quickly refuel. Fruits, otherwise known as berries, are the major food source for many songbirds during fall migration along the Atlantic Flyway. Loss of suitable habitat is a major factor in the declining population of migrating birds. What can we do to support migrating and overwintered birds? Provide berries for birds. Spring and summer berries. The fruits of different plants contain different amounts of sugars, fatty acids, and other nutrients and ripen in different seasons. Sweet fruits predominate in the spring and summer. Examples are the shadbush, red mulberries, and black cherries. The second category are autumn native berries. These berries ripen in late summer or early fall, become available just before the southbound migration. Autumn fruits are high in calorie-rich fatty acids, often 50% by weight. Examples are the spice bush, the dogwoods, and sassafras. Here is more detailed information about shrubs that I recommend for the North Fork of Long Island to support our bird population. The first is the spice bush. Its leaves have a spicy fragrance. You need separate both male and female sexes 
to have the red berries on the females. It is sometimes browsed by deer, but it's not a favorite. It has very understated, beautiful flowers, and here are the berries of the spice bush. The red twig dogwood is an excellent alternative to the flowering dogwood, which cannot be recommended due to its susceptibility to anthracnosis. The red twig dogwood can be affected though by powdery mildew and leaf spot in late summer. It attracts butterflies and other pollinators. It has bright red stems that look beautiful against the snow. Deer may browse it, but it's not a preferred plant. Fragrant sumac is a nice choice. It's low growing, slow to moderate growth rate. It's useful for ground cover and steep slope stabilization. It is tolerant of extreme drought and is rarely browsed by deer. In addition, it has beautiful fall color. The third category is autumn berries persisting into winter. Persisting fruits are available later in the small fall season and winter and are an important source of, source of food for overwintering birds and early spring migrants, especially when the late snow falls prevent birds from finding earthworms, insects, and other invertebrates. These berries have a lower lipid content than other autumn berries and are less prone to turn rancid and rot on the vine. Examples are the nanny berry, chokeberry, and American holly. The red chokeberry is a wonderful shrub. It's the black chokeberry is closely related. It has lovely white flowers in the spring. The red berries persist in the winter. It is drought tolerant, but it is irresistible to deer. Another good choice for berries that overwinter is the winter berry. It's tolerant of moderate drought. Separate sexes, male plants must be present for female plants to produce berries. Deer will frequently browse the leaves, but it is not a preferred plant for them. And here is the beautiful berries in the winter. Another shrub for winter is the smooth Wintherod viburnum. It may be a bit difficult to find here on the North Fork. It has showy profuse flowers in the late spring, is an excellent plant for caterpillars, and is generally not preferred by deer. More information regarding native plants and shrubs are available at the National Wildlife Foundation Native Plant Fire Finder, the National Wildlife Federation Garden for Life, and the Audubon Plant for Birds. Thanks to a generous donation from Rick Kedenberg, North Fork Audubon would be planting a Berry for Birds demonstration garden at our headquarters in Inlet Pond County Park. We're naming it after Rick's favorite bird, the towhee. Here are our take home messages. Plant keystone plants to regenerate biodiversity. Plant berry producing trees and shrubs to support migrating and overwintering birds. Reduce lawn area. Remove invasive plants. Don't use pesticides, get on the map. As Doug Salome said, in the past, Conservationists worked exclusively where people weren't. We now need to save nature where people are. We can do this one person at a time, regenerate biodiversity. I'd like to acknowledge the people from North Fork Audubon, Veronica, Robin, and Gwen, and Peggy, Sarah Morthland, Mina, Michelle Alfandari, and Doug Talamy. And most of all, I'd like to thank Mary J. Roman. That is the end. Well, th well thank you, Ellen. That was wonderful. Um, 
if anybody has any questions, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, if people would like to answer questions, that's the place to put them. And I just want to remind folks that we do have a native plant sale. We just had our, our fall native plant sale. We, we had many um, of the, the plants that Ellen mentioned, and we'll be having another one in uh, the fall, uh, the spring rather. So Karen says, what oh, a question from is, what about blueberries? Blueberries are actually great, great um, <clears throat> plants on uh, Doug Tallamy's list of um, the best plants. Blueberries actually rank number seven. Okay, fantastic presentation. Uh, I am wondering if chemical fertilizers, oh, hang on one sec. I'm wondering if chemical fertilizers have any negative effects. Hmm. Um, well, of course, if, if you're fertilizing your lawn with chemicals, then you have runoff that gets in the water system. Um, so, I mean, I think there's general agreement that uh, chemical fertilizers are not good for the environment. Okay, and um, someone asked, can we see the list of ideal plants again, please? Are you able to pull that up? Um, I think that I have to get back into sharing my screen, which I'm not sure, let's see. Did I share screen? Let's see, where did you go? There it is. Of course, all of, we'll put these lists on the website. So um, let's see, which you're thinking of the, the top, here it is. Um, oaks, cherries, plums, willows, goldenrods, asters, sunflowers, birches, poplars, and crab apples. Maybe the, um, can... there, there's just so much written about these keystone plants that if you go to any site like I, um, the Audubon site or the Wildlife Federation, they have, you can put in your zip code and they'll tell you the top um, plants in your zip code. Um, the top plants. We got lots of great uh, thank yous, wonderful and informative, fantastic presentation. Thank you, Ellen. There was one question I missed, hang on one sec. Is there any possibility of introducing new plant species to the area that will attract beneficial birds and insects, insects that are also new to the area? Um, I think that I think that that question has been answered and the, the answer is no. Okay. For those with cats, somebody wrote, this website offers great cat fencing. And you can see that in the chat uh, for the uh, www.perfectfence.com. Yeah, let's see what else. If I think I missed one more. I'm sorry, I'm a terrible. Oh, do birds like beach plums? Um, I believe they do. I, I don't know what number it is on the list. They love beach plums. They will strip a beach plum bear if, uh, yeah, they really love beach plums. And uh, Manuela said, what about replacing grass with clover? Um, I, th I think that that's a, a wonderful idea. Um, I don't know. I, I assume that clover is native and I've seen things written about it recently. Um, and I assume it supports pollinators. I, I think the point of the presentation is that there are plants that this so-called keystone plants, that by planting these plants, you get the most bang for your buck. And so that if you can plant these keystone plants and perhaps um, take away half of your lawn to have native plants, native keystone plants and herbaceous plants, 
then you'll be going uh, a long way to restoring biodiversity. Okay, let's see what we got here. I just, I'm gonna go down if, bear with me. Okay, somebody is asking if we can share the, the slide deck. Is that with the participants? And that's up to Ellen. Absolutely. Okay, we can do that then. Uh, two more messages. Can you suggest where North Fork residents can buy native plants this time of year? So um, it was so funny. I was on my way to work and I saw a truck that said North Fork native plants. And I don't know if Robin or Peggy or anybody has heard of them. They're a wholesaler, but yes, there are retail places. Um, they're often well hidden, but they are selling native plants on the North Fork. A um, couple places I'm aware of right now where you can get native plants are Trimble's Nursery and Cutshog, uh, Bed and, and Borders uh, in, uh, in Laurel on the main road, uh, the, gardens at, the Gardens at Bed and Borders, I think it's called. They have a. They actually have a lot of Glover perennials, which is what. Um, that's a wholesaler of native plants on the North Fork, but they're not always that easy to find retail. Um, and then there is a wonderful uh, tree and shrub nursery called Long Island Long Island Native Plants. It's a division of Countrymen. Um, nursery down in Eastport. And they have a, if you, if you Google that Long Island Native Plants, which is different from Long Island Init Native Plant Initiative, they have a wide selection of um, burying uh, native trees and shrubs. And that you have to order a minimum of 250 plants, um, of $250 worth of plants to, to shop there. But it's a, it's a really great resource for native plants around here. Okay, uh, Sharon says, Conic Estuary Homeowners Program offers $500 rebate for native plant garden. I don't know if that's, is that everywhere or is it just in specific sites? I'm wondering. I know at one point they had it around Ashamomic, they were offering that to folks and maybe they have expanded it. And by the way, I forgot to mention um, that the Peconic Estuary Program will be giving a presentation in October. It's not up on our website yet, but they'll be talking about uh, two projects that they're doing, one in Orient near Narrow River Road and a restoration project at the Paul Stamford um, Preserve. So please keep an eye out for that. Somebody did ask um, if spice bush, I believe was salt tolerant. Oh, can you share some salt tolerant shrubs? Um, Robin, can you help us out here? Sure. Uh, bayberry is, is, is fairly salt tolerant. Um, I've seen uh, elderberry sambucus growing close to the shoreline, um, both on Narrow River Road and actually at Inlet Pond County Park. It uh, has fabulous berries for birds. Um, what else that's really berrying? That's a good question. Well, beach plum. Beach plum is fat, is really, uh, I actually had, I uncovered my beach plum from with bird nets this year because the birds were so hungry. And as, as soon as I took the nets off, cause I usually make jelly myself, the, the, the plums disappeared within a day. And they of course will grow right on the beach. So um, yeah, I think also that's another thing that you can, you can Google, you can look on the various websites and, and just search for salt tolerance, but there certainly are lots of uh, burying things that grow around here on the beach. Oh, and I wanted, I forgot to mention Long Island Native Plant Initiative, which is a fantastic nonprofit. They're located up island now. They have a nursery in Brentwood at S Sisters of St. Joseph. Um, and they, if you Google them, they have an almost weekly newsletter in which they uh, talk about uh, native plants very reasonably priced. They're local genotypes. They're gathered from seed on Long Island, and they're a really, really great source of all kinds of native uh, grasses and, and some shrubs. They've got winterberries and uh, chokeberry and uh, 
So it's it's a really great place to to get very uber local Long Island plants. Wonderful. So I don't see any other questions. Uh, I, once Ellen uh, sends me the uh, the slide deck, I will forward it to you. They'll take us it may take us a couple of days to get the recording um, up. And we'll follow up with that. We'll also put the link to the, re we do it through YouTube. So we'll put the link to this recording on our website and uh, on the Berries for Bird page. And if you, it's it's right, one of the main pages on our website right now. So it'll be pretty easy to find. So does anybody have anything to say as we wrap up? Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. Great job. Yes, I agree, Ellen. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Well, then we'll say good night, everybody. And please don't forget about our program next week uh, on uh, Frederick Law Olmsted. Take care. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night.